What's up, everybody? So Wednesday, we had the NFC, and now we're on to the AFC. And today, I've got much less of an opening monologue, but I do just have to say thank you to all of you that heard me out at the beginning of that video and donated to the cause. Everyone who donated gave me an extra urge of energy to get this video out today, but I do want to thank specifically Hai Huang, Nam Adashank, James Brown, and my new patrons, Kelvin and Nick, for the generous support. I can't thank all of you enough. And then I do have a quick update on the whole Madden end of this stuff. So the roster with these updates are up on Xbox as of now. And then after I get dinner here, I'm gonna, uh, I've got about six teams left to get fully up to date with transactions and stuff. And then I'm gonna do some updates tonight on the draft classes and stuff. I know corners and safeties in my 2020 class somehow got overwritten, so I will be putting them back in here within the next 12 hours or so. So hopefully you guys have some good franchise stuff to play through. And then I'm also going to try and upload this weekend a recording of the PS4, uh, of the roster for the PS4 team so that they can duplicate it much easier, uh, which hopefully will get done. So lots of good stuff on the Madden end. Now let's get into the real football here. Here are the studs and duds from the AFC. And again, we normally do this on a week to week basis, but having skipped week 12 for Thanksgiving, uh, this week's going to be uh, not just a look of the last two weeks, talking about whose stock is rising, whose stock is falling, uh, but also taking a more macro look at the 2019 season as a whole. All right, so we're going alphabetically by city name yet again. So the Baltimore Ravens starting off here. So the usual suspects on the season, Mark Andrews continuing his climb towards being more of a top 10 tight end, uh, sorry, a top five tight end here. He has been incredible. Uh, not just what he has brought to the table as a uh, receiving threat there, but also what he's bringing to the table as a blocker. You know, it's no coincidence that, you know, obviously there's a lot of factors going on here, but this team has had a lot of success offensively. Honestly, in large part through Mark Andrews, you, you got to credit Lamar Jackson as we're doing again this week. Um, but what they're able to do through play action with what he's able to do as a blocker and then slip behind the linebackers, uh, creating separation as a mismatch problem. He has been not going to say equally as important as Lamar Jackson, but he's been a big piece of the puzzle there. And then Mark Ingram's been another big piece of the puzzle. You know, I uh, was kind of poking at the Niners because they kept crashing in on Mark Ingram in that game against Baltimore. Uh, and in turn, on the read options, I'm talking about crashing on Mark Ingram and letting Lamar get the outside. Now, I do think the way you got to play the Ravens is keep your contained guys on Lamar Jackson and make Mark Ingram beat you. But Mark Ingram makes that a lot harder because he can rip off six, seven yards of carry if you don't crash on him. So he just makes all of this even harder. And then Patrick McCarry, so their center, name's escaping me at the moment, I apologize, but uh, he's been their starting center, Matt Skura. Uh, anyway, he is down for the season with an ACL. And of course, the Baltimore Ravens of all teams are able to find a undrafted rookie out of California who can come in and play, honestly, maybe even better than Matt Skura was playing. This Ravens team is just incredible at finding talent out of nowhere. They're right there with the best teams in, in terms of doing that. Uh, so another just gem there Patrick McCarr he's getting a huge boost we'll, we'll continue to monitor him in the coming weeks and then Orlando Brown talk about a gem he's been creeping up all year a uh, third round pick last year the dude's just a mauler but his pass protection I mean he did very good against Joey uh, sorry Nick Bosa this week so he's been just one of the better tackles in the NFL in general this year and then Hayden Hurst first round pick last year he's been getting more involved as a receiver still I would say needs to be more physical as a blocker but to be your third tight end to just be a mismatch problem in the passing game he's been outstanding and then flipping over to the defensive side of the ball Josh Bynes has been an excellent pickup this year he's been every bit as good as CJ Mosley was there he even looks like him he's wearing number 57 he's got the short dreads like you honestly can't tell the difference so he's been playing great and then Chuck Clark you know Tony Jefferson is a bit of a fan favorite there but Jefferson has some liabilities in coverage he's definitely not the fastest guy he's like a 4 7 6 40 kind of guy and it does show sometimes as far as his range in coverage now Chuck Clark might not be able to light you up and be quite as physical in run defense, but it's not that he's bad at that. And he honestly is a better cover player than Tony Jefferson. I don't think it's coincidence that their defense has 
been more polished since Chuck Clark has gotten in there. And again, like a sixth round fine by this team. So he's been awesome. And then Chris Warmly has been good as a rotational run stuffer there. And then LJ Fort, another good linebacker pickup who's been really good in coverage for this team. So just more positives for the Baltimore Ravens. We're going to move on to their opponent on Sunday, the Buffalo Bills. A little less movement, but definitely uh, more positive steps for this team. It's a big win against Dallas. Uh, so Cole Beasley is getting really involved in this passing game. Josh Allen has really developed in his ability in the short game. And I think Cole Beasley deserves a lot of credit for that because he just gets open so well. And it's hard for Josh Allen not to see him. And then Isaiah McKenzie continues to to be a relevant receiver for this team. Now, for the most part, it's screens and out routes and pretty simple stuff, uh, but he continues to just get on the field and slowly diversify his route tree. He's only like 5'7", five, 5'8", five but man, is he fast, and they do a great job getting him involved, so he's creeping up a little bit. Uh, Del, uh, sorry, Devin Singletary. Uh, I did like him coming out, but he, I think, still, I do believe, has a lower floor, uh, sorry, a lower ceiling, you know, he's just not very athletic, but he is so good at making the first guy miss. He's very similar to Deion Lewis, you know. I think he's not going to have the most explosive plays. Um, and he can just kind of pitter-patter and get six-yard gains, turn two-yard losses into four-yard gains. And he's a good piece for this team. I still think they could benefit from having a true number one feature back. But to get him in the mid-rounds was definitely an addition to this team. And uh, because he's able to create those extra yards, I think it's it's very beneficial to this offense who isn't going to necessarily have the most consistent, most efficient offense, but he can turn what might result in a three and out into a much more manageable third down or even convert a third down and just keep the ball in the hands of the offense. So he does a lot of little things for this offense that I think might go underappreciated. And then Kevin Johnson, this was a good pickup, former first round pick, didn't work out in Houston. And he is absolutely playing well here. And they've stayed pretty healthy in that secondary, but he's found his way onto the field. Uh, both in the slot and on the outside, but he's been good pretty much everywhere they put him. He's shown more of those signs of that first round pick grade that he had coming out. And then Trent Murphy has been solid on the edge. This team's very disciplined in their run lanes and Trent Murphy's been a part of that. Not offering a ton as a pass rusher, but been a good run defender. Tremaine Edmonds continues to develop. Young linebacker, he's still only like 21 years old, but he's one of the freakiest linebackers you'll ever see. His discipline has been up, his run defense has been better, and he's shown some nice things in coverage. And then Ed Oliver has been a, I think, game changer for this Bills defense. Two, uh, sorry, four sacks in the last two weeks. And I mean, it's no secret that I loved Ed Oliver, but he did struggle right away. Was certainly considered a little more raw, but we know about that upside. He's one of the biggest freaks to ever come out of the draft, like in the history of the NFL. So he's starting to show some more of that upside as a pass rusher, uh, as that kind of undersized interior guy. All right, moving on to the, pardon my paper flipping here, the Cincinnati Bengals. So they've got some stock up here, some, some stock down as well as we look at the season on a more macro look. But Auden Tate, the big-bodied Kelvin Benjamin clone coming out of Florida State. I think Kelvin Benjamin's failures in the NFL outside of his rookie season is a big reason Auden Tate and, quite frankly, a lot of these just guys that don't separate coming out of college don't get drafted very high. Uh, it's not just Kelvin Benjamin. It's a real thing. Like, that's the number one thing that these spacing offenses are looking for is guys that can separate. So Auden Tate is still going to struggle at that, but he's improving his route running and his understanding of how to sit down in zones, which is big. And then also just, I mean, he's always been a guy that you know can go up and get it. And he's making some big time catches for this offense. So his stock is up. Geno Atkins, it's just age regression here. He's clearly not the same. So he's going down. Josh Tupua continues to climb as a Dave Gettleman award winner. Um, I think he won the award, but he's definitely one of those candidates. A uh, run defender that this team got on cheap. Andrew Billings, another guy that this uh, was a good pickup. He's been a really good run defender for this team. This defensive line in general has been really good. Uh, we are going to see Carl Lawson dropping here. So he tore an ACL or something. I think it was an ACL last year, and he had knee concerns coming out of college. So 
a player that I really, really like. I did have worries about him in this season because of those injury concerns, and he came out and had a great first game of the year, but has been very quiet ever since. I still like him, but I do feel like maybe those injuries are catching up with him. Uh, and then Dark has Denard. Uh, in the slot so he's on that fifth year option this year and he wants to get a contract and he's playing up for it he's had a really good season since coming back from injury lately uh, so he's going up and then Sean Williams has just struggled he's your typical box safety and his coverage liabilities have really shown this year after having a pretty good year last year all right the Cleveland Browns some movement on the offensive line Chris Hubbard going down Greg Robinson going up a little bit Robinson's been the more steady tackle this year Hubbard really struggling this year and then at wide receiver, Rashard Higgins was a lot of hope for him as this team's number three wide receiver this year. And I just think he's probably more of a slot type, honestly. He's just not much of a burner. He doesn't have a very good outside skill set. He's more of a smart receiver. And obviously, you've got Jarvis in the slot. So it's been a harder job for him. Uh, to kind of get into this lineup but yeah he's just not getting a lot of playing time and he's graded out really poorly when he's been out there so he's coming down Brandon Bryant gets created as an interior defensive lineman here don't know much about him but 65 overall uh, and then Sheldrick Redwine he was a mid-round pick out of Miami uh, he's a good looking safety he's getting on the field with the Morgan Burnett injury so stock up for him Joe Schobert, a lot of Browns fans loving them. Some Joe Schobert, he has four interceptions in the last two or three weeks. Now, I can guarantee you that at least three of them were just tipped, batted balls that landed right in his lap. I want to say the fourth was also that, so those do literally nothing for me. He continues to have a decent season. I still think he's a little oversized, can be beat in coverage most certainly, but he does have instincts as a run defender, and it's not like he's Blake Martinez. Like He has some understanding of route concepts and his coverage is a lot more consistent than a lot of these bigger slower linebackers so he's solid he is a you know average to above average linebacker and definitely worthy of you know being a starter in the nfl so i'm not trying to rip on him but i do think browns are still a lot higher on joe Schobert than maybe they should be and then sion taki taki he was drafted this year i want to say what third fourth round maybe even the second uh, just another one of these oversized guys that uh, are kind of instinctual, a little aggressive flying to the football, hard guys to block. I don't know if he's ever going to turn into some kind of star. I guess we'll wait and see, but he's been playing well. Then Porter Gustin coming out of USC, a lot of Clay Matthews comparisons with the long hair, edge outside linebacker type. Uh, he's been playing pretty strictly defensive end here. But a really good run defender, you know, he's, he's not going to be Clay Matthews. He doesn't have that pass rushing skill set. He doesn't have the explosiveness as an athlete, but uh, he has been a good undrafted pickup for this team. And then look, Larry Ogunjobi's really struggling this year, not getting after the quarterback as well as you'd like, and then really struggling as a run defender as well. This Browns interior defensive line has been pretty easy to beat this year outside of maybe Sheldon Richardson. Okay, let's move on. The Denver Broncos. So we got Cortland Sutton, red hot. He's one of the best receivers in the NFL this year, period. He looks like some kind of hybrid combination of Julio Jones, Allen Robinson, and Kenny Galladay. That's kind of, you know, where he's coming in for me this year. He's been incredible. He's my number one receiver in 2018. He's living up to be every bit of that. Uh, Drew Locke is lucky to have a receiver like this. Uh, on his team to go to and then Connor McGovern's been an excellent center this year he's always run blocked pretty well and he's actually not grading out as well as a run blocker this year but the questions were like can he anchor as a pass blocker and he absolutely has this year so he's been great they've got a good core on that offensive line that they're building around uh, so good to see a center uh, really filling in after they let one of the top free agents leave in uh, paradise all right, right tackle as well, Elijah Wilkinson. So they signed Jawan James to a pretty massive free agent contract, and that's been, uh, uh, not going to say a disaster, he's just been hurt. And it's been nice for them to have a guy in Elijah Wilkinson to step up as that flexible swingman tackle. He's been playing okay. I don't think he'd be an ideal starter, but uh, definitely a nice piece to have. And then Ronald Leary as well has been pass blocking very well. So the offensive line problems in Denver are not all fixed, but getting there. And then on the defensive side, Justin Simmons just having an outstanding season. He's just a flexible safety, can play some free, can play some slot, uh, strong safety, whatever you want him to do. 
amazing tackler, good instincts. We know he's got that crazy vertical as well to break up passes. So uh, loving what you're seeing from Justin Simmons. He's got to be due for a big contract extension here one of these days. I think he's in a contract year. And then on the interior defensive line, a lot of movement. So Shelby Harris has just been one of the most slept on players in this league, even by me for a long time. I mean, just outstanding run defender. He's not an elite pass rusher, but he can generate some push as well. Uh, so he's just a really solid player that's slowly developed into a top 15 to 20 interior defensive lineman. Uh, throughout his career as an undrafted guy out of a school that I can't even remember. And then Mike Purcell, total Dave Gettleman award winner type right here. They picked him up. Ironically, the guy that they let go to kind of fill this spot, Zach Kerr, is having an excellent season in Arizona. Just goes to show you how easy it is to find these nose tackles. You basically just have to be 300 pounds. Purcell's even bigger. You know, you just got to be a big fat guy that wants to try, and you can stop the run in the NFL. Uh, and then Von Miller is going to go down. Just not that elite, uh, you know, tier above other guys this year. He's been outstanding. He's still Von Miller, but he's not like all-time amazing. Like simply put, he just hasn't been that level. And then Draymond Jones, plus two. Loved him coming out of the draft, and this has kind of played out how I expected for him. I loved the landing spot. As we've seen here, Denver's done an excellent job developing more raw uh, interior defensive lineman and Draymond, Draymond Jones was exactly that I wasn't entirely sure he wasn't going to be a 4-3 defensive end almost like a Cameron Jordan and his explosiveness off the ball is insane but he was raw and they've done a really good job developing him he did not do much for the first 10 weeks of the season but he's getting on the field making a big impact here so love what you're seeing from Draymond Jones this interior defensive line in general is very good um, moving on the Houston Texans. Deshaun Watson's going to get a boost here. So plus one, 81 to an 82. He's been outstanding. He shredded the Patriots, which is not easy to do. Uh, he laid that one stinker against the Ravens. But other than that, he's been a borderline elite quarterback all year. So getting some love there. Darren Fells, nothing crazy, but he's been a steady pair of hands. Uh, and just a good big target there for Deshaun Watson that they like to uh, involve as a blocker as well. Roderick Johnson was a good pickup here. Uh, he flamed out in Cleveland after being a mid-round pick, kind of a high upside raw tackle. And he's settled in a little bit as a swing tackle here. He's played both left and right uh, in the events of injuries throughout the year. So he's getting a little bit of love here. He's not a great player by any stretch of the imagination, but he's decent depth. Kiki Kuti has really struggled. He's had drops, just hasn't been the impact. And, and he is not certainly benefiting from the fact that they did bring in Kenny Stills, so Kuti is their fourth wide receiver. But when he's been out there, he's been very abysmal. So he's going down. Same with Jordan Akins. You know, he's just kind of a weird player and isn't blocking very well, which is the reason we had slowly risen him up at the end of last year was, yeah, he's a good, versatile, kind of undersized tight end. You can get him open on play action, and he can, like, catch those easy passes and run with it. But it's a pretty simplified skill set. And uh, he was run blocking better at the end of last year, and this year he's just been terrible as a run blocker. Uh, then the two corners here, Gary and Conley, Bradley Roby, both Ohio State guys, both, like, first-round pedigrees, and they have definitely found a landing spot here. They look really good here in Houston. Uh, same with Vernon Hargreaves. Like they've done such a good job to acquire these high profile corners that are amazing athletes that were at a time considered like potentially elite that just didn't work out for whatever reasons. And they've all looked really good. And Vernon Hargraves, I think, has found a home in the slot. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, he was making a lot of physical plays for Tampa Bay early in the year. He had that huge fourth down stop uh, tackling Christian McCaffrey uh, on a fourth and inches on a pitch that won the game for them in Tampa Bay. So he has that slot skill set. He's a bit of a thicker, shorter, quick corner. So I really like this secondary as it is with this three. All of a sudden, I'm very intrigued by this trio of combinations. And I thought that Hargreaves should not have been released by, by Tampa Bay to begin with and then was just an excellent pickup for Houston. And then Charles Ameni, who's getting involved, uh, I think his role is increasing with the J.J. Watt injury. He kind of fits that flexible, uh, you know, oversized edge, undersized interior guy who they move around. All right, the Indianapolis Colts here. Uh, Quentin Nelson has been an extraordinary 
weapon for this team. He is mauling dudes. One of the best offensive lineman seasons you're ever going to see. 92 might not even be high enough. I wouldn't be surprised if he continues to creep up, honestly, towards that like 99 mark for me. Uh, and then Jonathan Williams, plus four, 65 to a 69. Just, you know, running backs, you can find them, especially when you have a great offensive line like this and a creative play caller. But he's been catching the ball well. He's been better in space than I thought he would be as opposed to just kind of a slow power runner coming out of Arkansas. He's very similar to me to kind of like what we see in Kansas City all the time where we see a Spencer Ware, a Daryl a Darryl Williams, Darren Williams, like all these kind of late round undrafted guys that are 6 feet 220 that can catch the ball. Maybe not the best top end speed, but a little shifty. He looks just like that. Uh, and then uh, the two tackles here, Anthony Costanzo, Braden Smith, they're getting into the conversation for the best tackle duo in the NFL. I'd still give it to the Saints, but God, these guys are incredible. And Braden Smith, like he's had his struggles actually as a pass blocker throughout the year, but his run blocking, like he is just so good. You can tell he's a former guard because he kind of has that uh, hit you in the mouth mentality that a lot of those badass interior guys have. And then wide receiver, talk about a badass, Zach Paschal. His run block grade is like an 85 or a 90. Like he's just the definition to me of an undrafted guy that got cut, that has a total chip on his shoulder. He's an oversized wide receiver. He's like 6'1", 215. Uh, I mean, and he just comes out ready to go. And his hands have been good. And he, you know, has been decent as a route runner. He's been their best receiver this year with T.Y. Hilton out. So I'm a big Zach Pascal fan. Good for him getting some love here. Uh, Bobby Okariki, uh, excellent pick here. Third round pick out of Stanford. Still not showing them like greatest run defense and pursuit and tackling abilities, but it just kind of goes to show you that that doesn't really matter. Like you just can't suck at it and you'll be fine. And I don't think he sucks at it by any imagination, but he's been awesome in coverage. Smart guy, obviously coming out of Stanford, understands zones, but he's got the athleticism to man you up as well. I mean, him and uh, Darius Leonard together is a, a dominant linebacker duo. And then Pierre Desir, he got a nice contract extension here. I, I could see him turn it around down the road, but he has been, holy smokes. A guy that defenses have been able to attack a little bit this year. Uh, all right, onto the Jacksonville Jaguars. Not a lot here uh, dropping on the offensive line. Cam Robinson's just really struggling here. Uh, just straight up, like just watch him. He just is terrible in pass pro. And then Will Richardson. So he recorded a zero pass blocking grade, uh, filling in at one of the guard spots in 21 pass blocking snaps. Now, I'm not an expert on the PFF formula, but as far as my understanding, I think that means that he literally recorded on 21 snaps the lowest possible grade, a negative two and a half on every single snap. That's like cut worthy offense right there. And then he recorded like a 6.9 grade earlier this year. So the guy is just struggling, was a third round pick, I think a few years ago. So clearly still in the developmental stages of his career. All right, interior defensive lineman, moving over to the defensive side of the ball. Taven Bryan just hasn't been getting the love as we go on a week-to-week -week basis, but he has been very steady, and he's made basically a full transition to an interior defensive lineman, was more of a Michael Bennett role, 4-3 uh, end in the Seattle scheme as a rookie, but they've acknowledged that he should just be an interior defensive lineman, and that's what he's doing. He's been really good in run defense. Has not been as good rushing the passer from the inside as I would maybe expect from an explosive guy like him, but at least he's getting involved as a run defender. Uh, Aubrey Jones is having a terrible season. I could see him getting released here. They extended him a couple years ago, but it's just not working out. Uh, and then Dewan Smoot, or Dwayne Smoot, I did like him coming out of Illinois, but just not working out here. He's been just not physical at all and just getting whooped in run defense. Uh, so moving on to Kansas City Chiefs, a lot of stock up here, some stock down on the defense, but uh, Mitchell Schwartz is continuing to develop like year after year. And this year, after the last two years, he's emerged as an elite pass protector. He's been really run blocking better. So Mitchell Schwartz at like 30 years old going up and then LaShawn McCoy is gonna drop here. 
And I, I said coming into the year that he still got a little bit in the tank, and I don't think I was wrong about that, but 81 probably a little high. He's just not quite as explosive and as big of a problem for opposing defenses as maybe years past. And then Andrew Wiley has been an outstanding pass blocker. When he's been healthy, they definitely missed him when he was hurt, but they're very happy to have him back. And then Charveris Ward continues his climb. He's been an outstanding breakout for this team at a position that they desperately need. Uh, so he's been solid. Rashad Fenton, good to have some slot corner depth here as Kendall Fuller does return to the lineup, it looks like. This week for a full go, he, he played limited snaps last week, but Rashad Fenton had to fill in for about a month with the Kendall Fuller injury there in the slot. He's a sixth round pick out of the SEC and uh, kind of lived up to what you would maybe expect from a slot corner getting drafted out of the SEC. So good for them to have some depth. And then Ben Neiman, nothing crazy, but he's been solid as a linebacker, as kind of a third guy. He's been better in coverage than in run defense, but needs a little love. He's been getting some reps and been a serviceable linebacker there for them. And then dropping down here, some critical pieces on this defense, Frank Clark. And I kind of tweeted this out. Uh, I, I did tweet it out. I didn't kind of tweet it out. This team chose to go with Frank Clark, Alex Okafor, and Bashad Breland as their two edge players and their corner. And they saved some money by doing that, but they also gave up a first round pick to do that. And the players they gave up were Justin Houston, who's killing it, D Ford, who's been killing it when healthy for the Niners, and Steven Nelson, who continues to develop and is having a career year in Pittsburgh. So they really screwed that up. I don't think it's a coincidence that their defense has been pretty poor this year. You know, they were bad last year too, but they definitely haven't taken the steps up that they maybe had hoped. Uh, so these guys are all really struggling. And then Darren Lee, I did like the idea to go and trade for a cover linebacker. Uh, he had a breakout season in coverage last year for the Jets, but was miserable for his first two years, former first-round pick, and he is back to miserable. He, they don't even want to play him. And when they did play him, the, he was just tripping over himself and just couldn't be in the right place at all. So he is going down yet again here, even though he hasn't played in a while. All right, so the LA Chargers. Austin Eckler needs some love. He's just been an incredible offensive weapon for them. Uh, he's been shifty after the catch, a steady pair of hands, a good route runner. Uh, so what he brings, and he's been a lot better between the tackles than you might expect as well. So he's been just a total weapon. He's probably been better than Melvin Gordon this year. Michael Schofield, that offensive line has been miserable, but to me it's more the center and the tackles. Schofield's actually kind of held his ground there. So to do it with, despite the surrounding talents, actually maybe even more impressive. And then Brandon Fasison. I mean, they've got injuries at corner. They've got depth issues. He's stepping up. I don't know if they have anything there or not, but uh, clearly better than his 60 rating we had him at. He's holding his own as he's getting playing time. And then Drew Tranquil, I had him uh, as a fourth to a fifth round grade. And my comparison for him coming out was Blake Martinez in that he can be a third linebacker. He can, you know, be a serviceable run defender, a smart player, good tackler, all that. And now, the Chargers are lucky enough that they don't need to make Drew Tranquil their number one linebacker like the Packers do with Blake Martinez, uh, but Drew Tranquil is filling in nicely to that role there. So he's going to get a little bit of love here. Uh, moving on to the Miami Dolphins. So Devontae Parker, an interesting subject here, former first round pick in a contract year, and he is having the definition of that breakout contract year. Now, I don't know if he's going to be the kind of guy that takes this momentum and runs with it and stays as a number one wide receiver throughout his career. I definitely have hesitations on that, but for right now, he's been a dominant force for this offense. Him and Ryan Fitzpatrick have been outstanding. Uh, they're putting up a lot of points lately, so Fitz needs some love. And then their center, Daniel Kilgore. Now, he's up there in age, so you kind of don't expect a late career breakout like this as a pass blocker to sustain, but he needs to go up. And then Mike Kosicki. This is big for this team because they invested a second round pick in him and not just that, they need a number two weapon to emerge here and he's slowly doing it. He's still not much of a blocker at all, but he's clearly a mismatch problem. He's producing for this offense. So he needs to continue to develop before he's a legit number two weapon, but he always was a guy that had upside and he's starting to show a lot more of it. All right, Steven Parker, 
plus two. He's just kind of the safety filling in here. In I guess can't even call it Mick Fitzpatrick's stead because he was kind of a slot corner. But anyway, I don't know if they have much there. He's going to need to prove a lot more before he's any kind of starting caliber guy, but he's been getting playing time and not getting roasted. Uh, all right, on to the New England Patriots. Isaiah Wynn has been really solid since coming back from injury. I uh, was just kind of waiting to see it on him. Uh, good grade for a rookie there as a 72 overall tackle in, in accordance to how I do my ratings. We just hadn't seen him yet, so he's, he's looking pretty good. And then Shaq Mason... Hasn't been a, an elite guard, so he needs to come down a little bit. Been a little worse in pass protection this year for sure. Uh, still a really good run blocker. And then wide receiver Jacoby Myers, plus 169 to a 70. He's actually been a hell of a lot better than Akeel Harry. Now, Akeel Harry did deal with injuries and just having a slow start, uh, I think especially because of that. But I was not a very big Akeel Harry guy. I had him as like a you know first to a second round grade, which is where he went. Uh, but not a true number one, like a jump ball, maybe Alshon Jeffrey kind of guy. Like he, he could be fine, but his separation issues were a serious issue coming out of college for me. And it showed as he tried to win on a slant route and the corner just ran the route for him and picked it off and sent it to the house. So like, and Keel Harry just has a long ways to go. I'm not necessarily giving up on him, but definitely we just had him too high as a first round pick. Uh, and then offensive line, James Ferentz. I believe he's the son of the Iowa head coach, by the way, so that's kind of cool. Uh, he's filling in at center and has been an upgrade for them, so he's going to go up. Kyle Van Noy needs some love. Definitely a guy that might not stand out on a week-to-week -week basis, but, I mean, he just does everything for this team. He's been having the best pass rushing season of his career. Uh, they've needed that with Trey Flowers leaving. And then just his coverage continues to be great. His tackling, he's just such a well-rounded outside linebacker, hybrid Belichickian linebacker, perfect fit here. Uh, and then Patrick Chung's going to go down. He's 32 years old. He's been bad in coverage this year, probably just some age regression here. He's also had some off-field issues year, this year that could be a distraction for him. Uh, so stock is definitely down for him. All right, the New York Jets on the offensive line, we got some drops. I mean, this line has been just getting whooped. They were terrible against the Bengals, so... Kelvin Beecham, veteran tackle. He's going to go down 76 to a 74. Ryan Khalil, he actually got hurt like week eight, but he was really bad when he's been in there. So he needed to come down. Now onto the defensive side, some optimism here as Blesswan Austin is emerging as a steal late in this class. And he was a sixth round pick. Fell because he couldn't get on the field in his last year at Rutgers, but fits the profile of a true number one uh, corner. And he's living up to the billing so far. He's been outstanding. So definitely keeping an eye on him. And then Brian Poole. I wish I would have made my top 10 undraft, uh, sorry, top 10 free agent signings video, or at least my top 10 value signings, because Brian Poole and uh Shaquille Barrett for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were my number one and number two guys when I had started preparing that list I just never got around to making that video so that would have turned out to be a pretty damn good call Brian Poole's been one of the highest rated slot corners in the NFL this year he had some struggles in Atlanta last year that's why they let him go uh, but he at a time was considered a, a top nickel corner so he's kind of back to that for a very cheap contract now he's probably going to get paid I'm pretty sure it was a one-year league minimum contract or uh, veteran minimum. And then Tremaine Johnson has struggled. Daryl Roberts has struggled. Uh, and it has uh, opened the door for Bless One Austin, Arthur Mollett. Both those guys dropping here have dealt with injuries. So Arthur Mollett going plus eight here. He's been outstanding as well. I don't know if he's going to stick like I do with Bless One Austin. Only time will tell there. Uh, but definitely getting some younger talent to help out in the secondary. This combination of Mollett and Austin on the outside and then Poole on the inside has been their best combo of corners uh, as far as production this year. Uh, so we'll see if that sticks. And then these uh, kind of cheap pickups here, Jordan Willis, who was a mid-round pick for the Bengals, kind of a stiff, oversized edge guy, but he's got some straight line power and he's been playing better in run defense lately. So he's going to go up. And then Kyle Phillips was an undrafted pickup out of Tennessee, and he's been playing the same role. Those guys just kind of rotate as run defenders on the edge, and they've been playing pretty well at that role. All right, the Oakland Raiders. Only three bits of movement here. Darren Waller continues to be one of the best mismatch problems in the NFL. His run blocking has taken a significant dip in the last five, six weeks. 
I don't really know why that is. I was dominant at it for the first month of the season, but has not reached that level. Definitely was not someone that was highly regarded for his ability to run block as a converted receiver who's never played at a high level until this year. So he may have just been a flash in the pan as far as his blocking ability, but there's no doubt as a receiver, he is outstanding. So been a big reason the Raiders have kind of broken out or been a surprise team this year. And then Hunter Renfro, just already like a top 15 slot receiver in the NFL was a no brainer, like sure to be good pick. And he's been that. And then Daryl Worley, uh, he's been a good starting caliber corner for them. I don't know if he's a long-term answer, but needs a little love there. All right. The Pittsburgh Stillers. Oh man, this is a new record. I think we got 16 players moving here. I think maybe we had 17 for the Niners, but anyway, let's get into it. Zach Banner's been a swingman for this team, and he's mauling dudes. So he's like 370 pounds. He is just a beast. Now, in pass protection, depending on matchup, guys have been able to kind of run around him. But as far as his run blocking, when he's been in there, I mean, they got to, I think, find a way to get him on the field more because he's just been such an asset in that regard, maybe as a six lineman and stuff. But uh, yeah, he, he needs some love there. And then Ramon Foster, I mean, he's 33, 34 years old. He's not been playing up to the level he did last year. I think last year might have been one last little hoorah because he was showing a bunch of aggression. And then last year at 33, he had a great year, was one of the best guards in the league. And then this year, he's back to kind of the major regression. So dropping him back down. Marquise Pouncey has been really bad this year. And he actually is just finishing up serving that suspension from the whole uh, Miles Garrett incident, and he might even be injured, but he just hasn't been a very good center this year. And I think they've actually gotten better center play since he's been out of the lineup. So we'll definitely keep an eye on that. James Washington's been a stud. He looked really good in the preseason, and then it took him a long time with the, quarter, the sort of quarterback uh, turnaround on this team, but he has settled in here, uh, especially more with Hodges, who's just kind of a gunslinger mentality, and it's working out with Washington. Some of the contested catches he's making – you know, if they made a top 10 catches on the year video at the end of the year, I think Washington would have at least two of them. He's been just remarkable. Uh, so he's been stock up really since the preseason and creeping up and up and up after a disappointing rookie season. Then Benny Snell, he got on the field this week and really to nobody's surprise produced at a pretty high level. He fits the mold of what Pittsburgh's looking for in those versatile over, not oversized, just bigger backs. And he was good at Kentucky and this team does nothing but crank out running backs whenever they get an opportunity behind this scheme and this offensive line. So he just seems like the next guy that's a pretty good player. Uh, obviously, they're going to go back to James Conner if he's healthy, but good to have the depth. Uh, and then the quarterbacks, Mason Rudolph, time to drop him. I know he got benched a couple weeks ago, but we haven't done a studs and duds since then. So uh, he gets benched. Duck Hodges is going to pass him up. Uh, it's, he's going to be a fun guy to play with. I actually changed his name to Duck in the Madden roster. Just, you know, we all like to have a little fun here and there. And then he's got kind of that Phillip Rivers release. He's got a weird release. So I went ahead and changed his throwing mechanics. So he could be a fun guy to go and play with if you're doing franchises this weekend. Now, I do think he's a career backup. But I've said multiple times throughout the week that he reminds me a lot of Case Keenum, who came in for a Vikings team who had some good offensive weapons and a really good defense and made a good playoff run. So I don't know if that'll happen here, but Duck Hodges, as far as his playing style and his kind of balls to the wall playing style, reminds me a lot of Case Keenum. Uh, Vance McDonald, he's having a just terribly disappointing season. Now, part of that is Big Ben and him had a good rapport in the receiving game. But his blocking, like you can't blame your quarterback for that. He's been just getting stomped on in the, in the run blocking game. So that's concerning. Uh, and then on the interior defensive line, these guys need some love. So Cam Hayward, you can make a case for him as the best interior defensive lineman outside of Aaron Donald in the NFL right now. He's been dominant, both as a pass rusher, as he always been, uh, has been. But he's even taken a step up as a run defender to that elite level where you can't run at him at all. Uh, he's been, I think, the highest rated interior defensive lineman as far as run defense goes this year by PFF. Uh, he's been a big, big boost to this defense, the step up he's taken. And then Javon Hargrave as well. He's been steady for the last three years, just a really good interior defensive lineman. Uh, so he's getting some love. And then Tyson Alualu, he looks like that first round pick that he was 10 years ago this year. Uh, get involved as a really good run defender, a little bit as a pass rusher. But this interior defensive lineman, uh, they've all stepped up too. 
despite, uh, or I guess I should say with the Stefan Tuitt injury. So he's out and these guys have really stepped up. And then TJ Watts having a, a defensive player of the year type of season, just 15 sacks, his pressure rate is incredible. Uh, he has taken a massive step up this year. So he's been awesome. And then Bud Dupree as well. To me, this feels like a contract year situation where he's kind of going out, kind of like Nick Perry or a little bit of D4, but D4 is kind of played better, I guess, than anyway. I do not necessarily see Bud Dupree sustaining this really high level pass rushing. Maybe he has just turned a corner, but who knows? Got to boost him up for uh, how he's playing this year. We'll see if he sustains it. Minka Fitzpatrick, plus one, just been a solid you know, cover guy the last month. Obviously, when they first acquired him, he, he was breaking out as a like defensive player of the year candidate. I made a video about how his interceptions were lucky and that he's playing well, but like, let's not freak out and call him a defensive player of the year because a few interceptions have fallen in his lap. He's been an outstanding free safety, one of the best in the NFL this year. Uh, so we are gonna raise him up here, uh, but he hasn't really had a whole lot of big plays since I made that video. Uh, Cameron Sutton, plus two, 67 to a 69. Uh, he was a third round pick and they get him on the field over Mike Hilton sometimes. And I think they just, you know, they invested more in him. Mike Hilton is set to be a free agent here. So they're probably saying, you know, we're probably going to let Mike Hilton go. I don't think we really want to pay a nickel corner and we like what we have in Cameron Sutton. So they're kind of getting him to de develop in part of a rotation here. I think that's actually pretty smart and he's playing really well. And then we mentioned Steven Nelson earlier. He's having the best year of his career. He's been slowly developing. I like him. He's a good athletic corner. He's a smart guy, but mainly he's just a good athlete and can run man. Uh, and then you can always develop a guy's zone ability, I feel like, especially a well-coached team like the Steelers here. So he's been a great pickup for this team. Him and Hayden and the slot corners they have here with Minka behind him and this pass rush, this defense is real nice. And the linebackers are playing great this year too. All right, the last team here we're moving this week, the Tennessee Titans. Uh, Ryan Tannehill getting a boost here. Don't need to explain that. He's been outstanding. He's really turned around the future of this organization. I do think he's going to be back next year, whether it's on the franchise tag or a two-year, 40-something million dollar contract. Uh, always good to see a guy with nothing to lose kind of playing up to his potential a little bit, I guess. Uh, Khalif Raymond. He has announced his presence as more than just a five foot eight kick returner. He's making a few big plays every week. Tannehill's just kind of throwing it up to him deep, letting him make some plays, and he's coming down with these things. So he's more of a relevant piece here on this offense. Nothing crazy, but definitely getting involved. Derrick Henry getting a plus three boost here, 80 to an 83. He's been a beast. He's running with more of the identity that he should have as a 250 pound running back. He's looking to run you over. He's hitting holes harder. He looks great. It's been a big reason this Titans offense has been so explosive. He's not a perfect running back. He's not versatile. He doesn't get involved as a receiver much, uh, but he does do that one thing pretty well. He, he does run. He does one thing very well, and that is run in a straight line. There we go, Marcus. Talk, talk simply. <laughs> All right, center, Ben Jones, plus two. 76 to a 78, PFF's number one rated center this year. And he's been a big part of that run game. And he's buying more time for Tannehill to throw as well. So a late career, not gonna say breakout, he's always been a good center, but he's definitely been a good piece for that team. AJ Brown going up, Corey Davis going down. Funny how things work. They took Corey Davis earlier than he probably should have gone. I did think he was a first round talent, but probably not a top six pick or whatever they used on him. He's been solid, but just hasn't taken that next step this year that I thought he would. Um, but then AJ Brown, they got in the second round and he's looking like a guy that maybe should have been a top 10, top 15 pick. He looks like a beast. Looks like he fits the, the profile of a true number one wide receiver. He's got the size, speed, route running, release. He blocks, like he does everything. Run after catch, he's just a beast. Uh, so he's going up. Linebacker movement here. Jayon Brown's been their best linebacker this year. He continues to just be steady in coverage and kind of fly around and make plays. So he's going up 75 to a 76. Wesley Woodyard at 33 years old. He's come into a rotational role. He's basically this team's Sean Lee at this point. Uh, but he's not played well when he's been out there. He's been missing tackles and just hasn't been a force at all. Uh, and then Rashawn Evans is going to go down as well. Uh, has regressed this year after a better year last year so he's going down and then Harold Landry plus one 75 to a 76 
He's been racking up the pressures, the sacks. He's been a beast, baby Vaughn. So he's he's getting some love. And then Ty Smith. So this is probably an oversight with the 62 rating. So he's been a depth corner here. They lost Malcolm Butler for the year here, and they go to Ty Smith this week. It's a full-time start on the outside. Uh, definitely an oversight here with the 62 rating because he played about 200 snaps a couple years ago, not last year, but two years ago, and was a solid corner uh, that year. So probably should have been a little higher. He comes in, has a good week this week. We'll keep an eye on how he plays. He's kind of set to be the starting corner. So I'd imagine he's going to keep going up if he plays really as he's played in the NFL. So plus five, 62 to a 67. Isaiah Max been a good undrafted defensive line pickup here. Uh, we normally say these guys are contributing as run defenders, but Max actually been uh, much better as a pass rusher than in run defense, generating, generating pressures with his acceleration and power on the inside. Kameli Correa, he's a rotational edge linebacker here, but they like him in their nickel packages as a guy that can drop into coverage. He's a guy that's actually played traditional off-ball linebacker. He's played some edge, so he's a good 3-4 scheme fit. He's got the size to pass rush, uh, but also the athleticism to drop into coverage and kind of the short area quickness you look for for that skill set. So he's a nice little player. Uh, and then Jarrell Casey, by the way, on Kameli Correa, I'm honestly surprised that he's never ended up either like in New England or Detroit or Miami, like where you get these Belichick schemes because Kameli Correa is the ideal prototype Belichickian linebacker. Uh, and then Jarrell Casey just hasn't been a superstar. He's 30 years old. His pass rush rate is down. He's been a much worse run defender. His defensive stops are down. So uh, just not the best year for him. Maybe he has a late career reemergence, but definitely seems to be trending in the wrong direction for Jarrell Casey. But it is a good thing that they've got guys like Simmons and Daquan Jones playing at a pretty high level there to sort of replace him in a way. All right, those are the studs and duds. I hope you guys enjoyed this and the NFC. I, I do hope if you've listened through all of this, you uh, consider what I said in the NFC video, consider a donation. Definitely hit that like button though. If you're still with me here, you might as well. Uh, so that's it. Cheers as always, and we'll see you the next one. Peace out.